This video is looking at Journey's End by R.C. Sheriff, Act 3, Part 1. So you need a copy of uh, the text or somewhere to make notes. And what we're going to be doing is looking through it and then picking out the points that you can use in essays, looking at either how the um, extract, uh, an extract from the play is used, or some character notes. So if we follow the text through, we've got Act 3, and stage directions are always useful. So first of all, we've got this idea of sunset and that the light slowly fades. So whenever you get that, it's that idea of pathetic fallacy. Okay, You've got the idea that light represents hope. It's slowly fading. We're getting nearer and nearer to the men's kind of inevitable deaths. Um, so you can mention that and you can mention it also as a dramatic effect in terms of the lighting, right? Um, because it's a play, we would be able to see that on stage. We have Stanhope alone, which can foreshadow um, the final scene of the play where he's alone in the dugout after Raleigh's death. And the wandering to and fro shows that he is in a kind of restless state of mind, right? He is um, kind of concerned he can't settle. When Mason comes in, we're trying to get this kind of idea of normality, this facade of normality. A facade is a kind of false front, okay? So Mason is a character who's got a slightly comic edge and he's he's trying to kind of make it all seem normal we get the repetition of this stage direction so your um, essay or a point may say that at the start of act three stan the stage directions reveals stanhope to be repeatedly wandering to and fro okay that's important because it means that he really can't stop. You know, if you're nervous, you you can't stay still. And the discussion with uh, between the Colonel and Stanhope reveals that actually um, where they've blown a hole in the enemy lines, those red rags have gone up again. Um, now, you'll recall from earlier in the play that um, one of the characters um, says that you know, a, a hole was blown in the fence, that the Germans actually put red rags either side and they refer to it as murder, OK, because it was an indication um, that the Germans knew exactly where the hole was and they were lying in wait to kill the soldiers coming through. And this exchange, this duologue between... Um, let me, see, let me spell that correctly. Um, between Kurt the Colonel and Stanhope shows the priorities or the mistaken priorities of command. Okay, the Colonel is kind of displaying a degree, um, I suppose, of, of um, there is a degree of moral cowardice about it that he's he's not pushed the idea of changing the raid, but he's also kind of implying that he knows exactly kind of what's going on. You know, he knows that the men are being sent to death. Otherwise, he wouldn't have changed or wouldn't have suggested that these times were changed. Um, sadly, the colonel's character is shown here that he's impatient Okay, this could show some frustration on his part. It could show some upset. It could show the idea that he's just tired of everything. But Stanhope's sort of saying, come on, surely they, they have to realise that we're sending the men to die. And the colonel doesn't let him finish. That interruption prioritises the report over the men's lives. He's, he's, um, Colonel Stanhope has kind of come to the conclusion that nothing can be done. These, uh, the death of these men is near inevitable. 
it's going to happen. So he is going to concentrate on his paperwork. He needs to get his um, documents. Um, Stanhope says rather cynically that actually all of the arrangements are there to preserve the general's um, dinner time, their own leisure, their priorities. If you are cynical, it means that you are looking on the kind of bad side of things the whole time. You're never, um, you're never kind of optimistic. We have kind of some kind of practical concerns here. And the colonel is, is kind of acting as if everything is, is absolutely fine. Okay. Um, he's being kind of um, falsely positive here. He's acting as though it's all, you know, all going to go well. So words like blow across nicely, the wind's just right, um, everything's ready. He's trying to kind of create this impression of positivity that it's all going to um, go well. You also have the contrast between Stanhope's restless movement and the Colonel's comments here. Again, he's trying to kind of downplay. He's trying to kind of um, make it seem like it's not a problem. Um, he's diminishing the risk that the men face. If you diminish something, you lessen it. OK, so he's seeking to diminish the risk, saying it's only 60 yards. Right? Um, there's a whole kind of set of those just going like the blazes, bundle him across, making it seem wider than it is. Yeah. Talked about the irony of the selection of the men. The idea that Stanhope is kind of acknowledging really that these these men who are the best or youngsters, strong, keen chaps, are the ones who are being sent to die. So you are choosing the fittest men to die. It's the irony of war. Okay. When we get to the idea of the red rags, we can recall Trotter's earlier comments that this signifies murder. Okay, this is sending men to their certain deaths. You might want to question in your notes who is guilty of the murders. Okay, because the implication by sheriff is that it's the generals and the commanders who are sending the men in regardless. The Germans are almost just the mechanism by which these men are being killed. The decision to kill them is being taken by their own command units. Okay. So then we're looking, we look down here at this section and again, there's that kind of tension between Stanhope and the colonel. Stanhope wants the colonel to face the men and the colonel really kind of doesn't want to face them. So again, we've got this idea of moral cowardice and pretense. We have Colonel Stanhope is trying to say, don't you think the men would rather be left alone when in fact he means I don't I don't want to face them. I don't want to see them. OK. The idea here of you'll put up a good show is kind of a euphemism. A euphemism is when you use a softer phrase to disguise a harder phrase. So here, the idea of you'll put up a good show is kind of using an entertainment metaphor to disguise the fact that what they're about to do 
is almost certainly going to involve the deaths of many of them. Okay, so we've we've had, you can just notice here that Osborne and Raleigh are here at, at have just come in and are being all um, uh, kind of uh, positive. Okay, if we turn over the page, we've got this idea of just going like the blazers and the colonel's offering some last last minute advice. Obviously, we've got the colonel trying to emphasise the individual contribution to the war effort, whilst everybody knows that the men are being treated as dispensable. So there is a tension here. The colonel is portraying the fact that each individual can be significant. But the reality is that individual lives don't matter. He's kind of perpetuating, means carrying on, perpetuating the lie that these kind of men individually matter. When you get to this section, the last thing the colonel says to them in terms of don't forget to empty your uh, pockets of papers and things, you have to think, why is that? Well, if they get killed, the colonel doesn't want any important information about the English position being found on their bodies. OK, he doesn't want anything that's going to disadvantage the English side. So it's a kind of implicit so it's not a direct, it's an implicit acknowledgement of the fact that they are likely to be killed. Okay, when Osborne says, don't think I'm being morbid. If you're morbid, then you are kind of obsessed with death, right? Or if you're um, kind of concentrating on death. So he's saying, you know, don't don't read anything into it, but he wants to make sure that Stanhope has got his letter, his watch and his ring because Osborne is kind of aware of the reality of what he's about to do. And he doesn't want his ring. He doesn't want his uh, watch getting lost in a field when he dies. He wants his wife to be able to have them. And again, this idea of carrying on that idea that everybody's going to be fine because otherwise, you know, you would go quite mad. Um, Stanhope kind of refuses to acknowledge really what Osborne's doing. And, and they kind of cover the seriousness of the situation with humour. So they use humour to cope. Right. And there's this moment where Stanhope lingers because they know really it's kind of being goodbye at this point. If you linger, you kind of hang around for a moment. And then there's this moment where their eyes meet. So they look at each other and there's a moment where they kind of the the kind of truth passes between them. But then again, it's covered by laughter, okay? So Sheriff often uses kind of humour or the humour of the men to, sh to deal with what they're facing. It's a coping mechanism, okay? It's how you actually deal with what's going on, right? So Osborne says, just time for a small... And they kind of have... A, a Osborne and Raleigh have a moment together, just that quiet kind of um, dialogue where, they're, again, they're trying to pretend that everything's absolutely OK. Yeah. Raleigh is kind of seeking some degree of reassurance because he's a much younger man 
and he doesn't really appreciate the kind of severity or the seriousness of what they're going to do. We've got another kind of look up here. You know, Sheriff is using these kind of moments where the men look at each other as indicating kind of some degree of truth, right? That there, there is a lot being said in a kind of glance between them rather than um, the uh, what they're actually saying. This particular little bit of the exchange here is a nice point to remember to illustrate the differences between the two characters. So Raleigh's apparent enthusiasm um, versus Osborne's kind of realism and, and desire to delay. Rally is still viewing what they're about to do as a chance to make their mark on the war, a chance to kind of find, um, do something brave, win the MC. Whereas Osborne is more realistic about the idea that this means almost certain death for them. And so he has got no desire to go early because he's he knows he's thinking about the final few minutes of his life. So they rehearse the plan kind of over and over with Raleigh being optimistic and Osborne trying to match Raleigh's enthusiasm. So, you know, when I shout, when I blow my whistle, pounce on this, bundle him out. He's trying to make it seem like it's going to be simple for the benefit of the younger man. Again, on this page, some um, differences between the characters, this kind of juxtaposition, the placing side by side of Raleigh and Osborne to emphasise the difference between them. So the juxtaposition of these characters shows Raleigh's naivety as opposed to Osborne's realism. Okay, if you are naive, you are innocent. If you are, re if you are displaying realism, you're realistic. You're not lying to yourself. Um, this is quite a nice line to show Raleigh's kind of enthusiasm. And the idea that Osborne is kind of focusing on the coffee means he's trying not to think about the idea of what they're about to do. When we come down to the recitation, okay, of the Alice in Wonderland um, kind of verse, and the fact that Raleigh picks it up there, it's a little bit of escapism. Okay, they're trying to kind of avoid facing the reality of their situation. And we know that Osborne's already said, you know, the point of this is it's nonsense. It's not serious. It's not dealing with any of the issues they have to deal with um, in the trenches. And the fact that Raleigh kind of picks it up and can finish it is also, you know, emphasising that actually... Rally is a very young man. He's still sort of childlike. He just finishes off what is a children's rhyme. So for Osborne, it signifies escapism. For Rally, it signifies his childlike quality. And they they fall into conversation about where they live. And the idea that Raleigh saying, you must come and stay with us one day. And Osborne agrees, I should like to awfully. So they are planning a future that is unlikely to happen. And again, it's this idea of, of a kind of defence mechanism. 
they are trying to ignore the fact, they're trying to deal with the fact that actually they are not likely to survive. Yeah, so they are talking about the future. And with, with Raleigh, you get the impression that he's using this to help him come to terms with the idea, the growing suspicion that actually they may not survive this. Okay, so this kind of conversation continues with them making plans and trying to lose themselves in conversation about a future that they won't have. The glancing at the watch is a reminder of the shortening time, the impending um, raid and what it represents. So no matter how often they talk about nonsense or how often they talk about their plans for after the war, they still have this idea of time ticking. The raid is getting ever closer. The significance of the ring comes back here, that Raleigh doesn't see the significance of what Osborne has done. You know, again, he's, he's very young, he's very innocent. And Osborne, again, kind of lies to rally to help preserve the younger man's innocence um, rather than saying I'm leaving it here because you know when I get killed I want my I want it to be sent back to my wife and not lost he just uses the kind of rather euphemistic I don't want to risk losing it um, and Raleigh's silence and the idea that he puts the ring slowly down, again kind of indicates that growing fear and realisation. He's beginning to appreciate that this is not the kind of um, heroic, you know, fun, exciting thing that maybe he thought it was, that this is actually serious danger that they're in. Okay, and again, final sort of joking from, from Osborne in terms of trying to preserve that sense of normality. You know, I hate leaving my pipe. Just the idea that, again, he, he knows that he's probably not coming back to it. The constant time checks are worth commenting on, as are the constant kind of their eyes meet references. And this part of the dialogue here is kind of short exchanges. It's fragmented, so it's in fragments and it's awkward. You've got these two men not quite knowing what to say and so falling back on cliché. Cliché is something that is kind of like an overused image this idea we must put up a good show um and lots of exclamations that give kind of emphasis you know rather righto um trying to kind of deny what they're about to do if we look at the stage directions You've got the um, you've got Osborne and Raleigh go out and again into the pale evening sun. That idea of, you know, the light fading that Mason is trying to kind of tidy up as if everybody's coming back. And then the kind of distant but encroaching kind of noise. So everything happens off stage, but it emphasizes how I suppose how near this raid is. You know, all the way through, there's been the emphasis that the Germans are not very far away. And we're just getting that, you know, the noise mingles in confused turmoil. So we can hear all the explosions, the German alarms are for the English raid. It kind of shows how close they are, the proximity of the two sides. And actually the fact that all the noises together kind of emphasises, I suppose, a degree of common 
humanity. These are all men living in trenches very close to each other. And straight away, when we come back, Stanhope, his concern is trying to get people safe. The colonel's concern here is, is the value of the intelligence. How many people have they managed to grab to possibly get information out of? So this particular section just shows the difference between the colonel and Stanhope again. There's only the one kind of implicitly invites you to question, was it worth it? Okay, you're going to look at the cost to the English. They've managed to grab one German soldier, but at the expense of six Englishmen. Um, Stanhope is pale and haggard. Haggard means that um, he looks kind of stressed, drawn, gaunt, ill, pale, um, because the war is having this physical effect on him. Okay, he's just lost uh, men. He's, he's just seen, you know, he knows friends have died. Um, and that is added to the psychological effect that we've seen throughout the play. Stanhope's priority is to go down and see the men again. So he is showing the good instincts of, of a leader. And we get the German boy coming in, sobbing bitterly. So again, both sides, um, it's the human cost. And the boy is young. Okay, So just like Rally, you know, this is a, a boy who shouldn't be in this position. Um, they drag him away or they, they kind of drag him into the dugout and all he can do is cry. Okay, He sobs hysterically. And then the exchange in in German, um, you know, what is your what is your regiment, the Württembergische, was ist der Nummer von sein Regiment? What's the number of your regiment? Twenty. Okay. Wann kommen Sie here? When did you come? Gestern Abend, yesterday um, evening. Okay. So, wo kommen Sie her? Um, you know, where did you come from? And he asks, you know, um, my Geburtsort, you know, the, the area of my birth. And this is kind of reminding you that this is a whole life that's, that this boy represents. You know, he has an area of Germany where he came from, as well as kind of his purpose to these men is to say, you know, where did you come from? Like which, which area have you come from? Where have your regiment come from to get military information? But just for a moment, we get this glimpse. He thinks he's being asked, where were you born? OK, which is, is a kind of personal. Um, and the colonel says, no, you know, I, 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 I don't want to know that. So where I don't tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not allowed to tell you. Um, and the value of the boy is measured by the colonel and the sergeant major in terms of what information he can provide. So what he's got on him. It's, it's kind of overlooking or discounting his humanity, his position as a human being. And he says, you know, he wants his, his personal things back. You know, leave me, lassen me, lassen sie me. Um, if we look down here, the colonel is pleased with what's been found because his excitement is all to do with the information. And so far, really, the colonel hasn't showed any emotion or any indication that, you know, they've lost a lot of men. It's just, I must go right away and phone the brigadier. It's a feather in our cap. A feather in our cap is idiom for a kind of award, a good point for us, recognition for us. So again, you know, the colonel's priorities have become distorted, have become changed. 
kind of twisted by war. He's got these distorted priorities. You know, the, the brigadier will be really pleased with me as opposed to six people have died. And Stanhope, you know, in the circumstances, that's why, you know, it's one look of astonishment. And here, it's a kind of pointed, um, you would say a barbed comment. How nice if the brigadier's pleased, okay? And all of a sudden, that kind of brings the colonel to the realisation that he hasn't asked about the raiding party. And the fact that are they all safely back is a kind of, um, it's, it, it's not a lie because he's not saying they're all safely back, but, but Stanhope picks him up on the idea that did you, do you expect them to all be safely back? Like, what are you talking about? Um, so it's again, it's a denial of reality by the by the colonel um four men and rally came back okay so that's six men and a uh, osborne okay so he he totals up who came back because you know the the men are, are the kind of soldiers rally is named because he's an officer so the colonel works out that actually Okay, so they lost six soldiers. They must have lost one officer, and that officer must be Osborne if Raleigh's back. Um, and you know, I'm I'm very sorry is all he can say. Stanhope's repetition of his line up here kind of shows his upset, his distress, his frustration, and his anger with the colonel and what the colonel represents. You know, it's still, it'll be awfully nice if the brigadier's pleased. You know, I've lost six men, including, well, six men and my best friend. But it'll be okay so long as your boss is happy. You know, there's that really kind of angry, upset um, thing. And he says, you know, don't be silly. That's a kind of dismissive. Okay, if you dismissive, you are kind of sh uh, waving off somebody's feelings. And then the colonel has the kind of good grace to say what happened to Osborne. He was blown up by a hand grenade while he was waiting for rally. So that kind of um, is a kind of indicative. It's an indication of Osborne's character. You know, the idea that he got killed when he was waiting to see that um, rally was OK. And the six men machine gun bullets, I suppose, you know, this this acknowledgement here that we sent them into a trap. Of course they got machine gunned. The Germans were expecting them. Yes, I was afraid. Uh, and the fact that he can't speak shows the idea that language is inadequate. Okay, He knows that there's nothing he can say to make this situation any better. Okay, Stanhope looks at him with a pale, expressionless face. Raleigh comes slowly down the steps, walking as though he were asleep. His hands are bleeding. So we've got the impact already it's had on Raleigh. Okay, the idea that he has already changed. He's, he's kind of unable to process, really, unable to appreciate what he's seen or what he's done. And the colonel tries to um, kind of... Uh, snap him out of it, tries to get the old rally back. Rally is now changed, okay? Rally has seen awful horror. He's seen Osborne killed or he's realised that Osborne's been killed. He is slightly injured. And the promise of this military cross, this award that before was so important to Rally, you know, maybe we'll get the military cross. He just um, can't can't even speak. He puts his hand to his head, sways, and, and he's kind of invited to sit down. So this marks a significant change in rally, the psychological effect of war on rally. And we'll leave it there for, for this video.